Today we're going to talk about Lori Vallow Daybell, also known as the Doomsday Mom. And she's a fantastic study. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Yeah, this video is a long time ago. This is right after her ex-husband was killed. However he was killed, we'll learn in the video. But this is hours after her ex-husband was killed by a gunshot from her brother. Now she is on trial in Idaho for the murder of her children and her current husband's ex-wife. This is also a charge to take her back to Arizona for the murder of her ex-husband. So intricate case, and this is a fun one to watch. Okay, I know this sounds silly, mm -hmm. um, but it's probably the easiest way to start mm -hmm. um, is just to tell me what happened. And then so you can start what makes the most sense to you, and we'll just work our way through, and I'll pro I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions just to kind of clarify. Sure. So I know you talked to the initial patrol officer. Um, and, and he just got information. He okay. Say um, so, yeah, if you can just kind of tell me kind of what happened, it sounds like some of this may have started last night or something along those lines. Right. So start where you think it makes the most sense. Okay. So, um... <laughs> I told you, it's yeah. a great question. Well, so we moved into this house three weeks ago because he offered to get me a house here where all my family is when okay. we were in Houston. And um, so he's like, we had decided to separate or whatever. So mm -hmm. we, he's like, well, I'll pay for a house for you and for JJ and whatever because he's all about JJ. He's never about Tylee, but he's all mm -hmm. about JJ. Because mm -hmm. right? we adopted him together. He's okay. his great nephew. We adopted him as a okay. baby. And, and so we adopted him as a baby, and so we've been raising him together. And he travels all the time for business, so he's used to just going back and forth. So he's always gone, like, Monday through Friday. So he came when we first moved in and brought me stuff from Houston, like a U-Haul. And then he hasn't been back. But it's all these threats on my phone all the time, you know, like, whatever, all these things. And then he told me... What kind of threats? Just... You'd have to read them to see, but he's always mad at me, right? Okay. And he doesn't want a divorce, but I don't like him and don't want to deal with him, so that's just how it is. Right? Yeah. So we married for 14 years, we dealt with him for 14 years, and him being horrible to her. Like, he gets in huge fights with her, he, yeah, a lot of things. But anyway, so he said, I'm coming on Wednesday night, all of a sudden. I'm not, I want to see JJ. I told him, I said, I will never keep JJ from you. You can come see him whenever you want to. Come take him to school, whatever. Like, I'm not going to do that. All right. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, okay. Look, some simple things here. I would suggest she's minimized rather than maximized. What do I mean like that? Well, she's taking up as minimal room as she can rather than maximizing the room that she takes up, the space that she takes up. We'll see her minimize even more during this. In fact, we'll see her minimize over this in a way that I've never seen before, a baseline change, which is probably the biggest I've ever seen in my life. Uh, abdomen is concave as well, tucked in, again, protective. Blink rate is, is high, I would say, even for somebody being um, interviewed in uh, in this way. So blink rate is already, I think, quite high as a, as a baseline. She's forward in her chair, though, so she's she's interested. She she's paying attention, though. That could be something to do with the concave nature of her abdomen as well. You know, uh, curled in here for protection. Very active hands. Very active descriptors. Uh, lots of symmetry, but lots of asymmetry as well. One last thing on this: that emphasis on. 14 years, 14 years. Seems that she wants some kind of uh, approval around that, uh, or certainly wants us to pay a lot of attention to this idea of 14 years. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, Mark, I love the fact you start off with baseline because we're going to see fantastic baseline, baseline deviations from this. And I always say the organism does what made the organism successful. This woman is a queen of what she does. And we're going to watch her through here, walk down. She doesn't do chaff and redirect. She does chaff, chaff, chaff and disparage victim. 
We're going to watch it. It goes on and on and on. If it were chaff and redirect, she'd be giving you something to go after. She isn't. She's just talking until you let her go the next path, and she disparages the victim. For those of you who are read method folks, guess what? She's telegraphing what she wants to hear from you. So that's a great opportunity for us to talk about read method as we work through here. There's a really smart guy I know who talks about planes and talks about passion planes and grotesque plane and truth plane. Watch the planes in this woman. She starts off locked down. These barriers are beautiful. She's got barriered hairs, her hands between her knees. And you can tell, I'm going to start by calling her big Lori, little Lori, as we go through this whole thing. It's a very different personality. She's apprehensive until she finds out what to expect. And there's in the eighties, there was a song called cause I'm blonde. I have a feeling this woman has made her lifestyle on that. Cause I'm blonde. And in the, in the lyrics to that, the woman would say, BLO, you know what I mean? She would finish no sentences. She would just trail off. And we see that a lot from Lori. She starts off with front of mouth talking and increased blank rates, which we indicate means stress. And she's being solicitous to the person who's talking to her. Then when she realizes what's going on, the sides of her mouth are pulled down, her head, her forehead's up and nodding. That's all intake, data intake. And that's a frown of understanding is all it is. But when she tells her, start where it makes most sense, watch that blink rate fade. Boom. And then she goes to M, M. She's delaying confrontation there. She leans and eye blocks and gives some nervous laughter. And we're going to see that a few times in this thing. This is probably one of the weirdest ones we've seen to yet. And I think, Mark, you might be right. Baseline deviation, buckle up. This is a good one. Scott, what do you got? All right. I this This may be my very favorite one because we're looking at a straight up, in my opinion, psychopath. And I want to go through why I think so, why my hypothesis that she has one as we go through this. Uh, Mark, you nailed it. Uh, I don't know what else to say about that. Uh, let's see what's important. She laughs in every video except two, except number three and number four. She's, she laughs in every one of them. We're talking about someone who has just seen her ex-husband killed or was there when he was killed, what, two or three hours ago? And she's she's so calm. Everything is just fine. It's like she's just come. It sounds like she's at a teacher's meeting. It sounds like one of her kids got in trouble and she's down there talking about that, but the kid didn't get that much trouble. But they said, come here, we need to talk about this. This is what this sounds like. The interrogator does such a fantastic job with this because what a psychopath does is they try to mimic the person they're talking to to get to engage them. We see a lot of romance in here where she tries to mimic the interrogator to get the interrogator to like her. It's fantastic. But the interrogator, I think she knows what's going on because some of these things, as we go through this, I'll point out some of the things where you go, she understands what's happening here because she's asking this or she's doing this. She does some classic, like you were saying, Greg, uh, read technique stuff right down, right down the line almost. And she does a great job at those. You can tell she's done it a hundred times um, now, but Lori hasn't had a chance to structure her story yet. So she goes through this. She's taking her time. She and she she laughs a little bit too much. And but she's we're going to see her her even though she's tucked in and down. We're going to see her go lower and lower and lower and turtling and turtling. Where finally we're going to see her hands below her knees on this when we get toward the end. It is something else to see this. Her her in this case her illustrators are fluid, but they're fairly low. So she's not showing a lot of confidence with what she's talking about. I know the fellow you're talking about, Greg, for the for the truth playing thing. He's a friend of mine, known for for quite a while, and he does a whole thing on he does a whole thing how I'm sure which he would go through that if he were on here uh, about the differences in those and how we're seeing those changes as we, as we go along. And then she's creating the reason this happened when she's asked the question. She's recreating the reason this happened, not what happened. So let's, t- let's talk about what happened. She doesn't tell what happened. She tells the reason it happened. So that this is just bells and whistles of watch out, something's up here. And keep in mind, she's she takes time to create this story because she hasn't had time to structure it yet. I think when she and her brother planned this, if it was a plan, everything went as they expected. But it's not hap- she doesn't have her story yet ready yet. She has she she hasn't gotten to where this 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 and this. She's and she's really laid back about the whole thing. That's the scary part about this. If in fact she was a psychopath. This will none of this would bother her. Listen to what she's talking about. Listen to the questions she's being asked and look at how she responds. Look at her body language overall. And this is basic body language stuff we'll be looking at. So, uh, Chase, what do you got? You don't nail a lot of the body language here, but I think the interviewer does a great job. She's saying, start where you think it makes the most sense. This is a great strategy in interviews because it allows the other person to pick what they think is relevant. 
and it avoids leading them into a hard starting point. And this lets you know if they're going to go through a rehearsed story or not, just how they respond to this one question. And right away, you're seeing something called GHT, gestural hemispheric tendency. Whether or not we gesture one side positive, one side negative, she uses her right hand like this and gestures off to her right to talk about anything negative. And her left side is used for positive topics while she's discussing the negative relationship with one child and the positive and loving relationship with the other. You're going to see this. This type of information can help us in a lot of ways. But most importantly, we're going to use this to see where she gestures in the future about certain issues so we can see how she feels about them. And later in the interview, an interviewer can move toward that spot and start gesturing a certain way uh, to, to change or uh, maybe change the way she perceives something as positive or negative, depending on how you want to frame it. And no one who's being threatened will gloss over being threatened unless they're either lying or trying to protect the person who did it. So she uses uh, the word whatever to describe these threats. And then when she's asked about the threat, she displays this uncommon hesitancy before answering, just lacks the ability to, to answer just a reasonable question. And at the end of this, you'll see more of this left and right GHT data coming up. When she's saying horrible to her, she's using a right hand again. I think it's her right. Yeah, her right hand again. And even pointing in that direction with her thumb. And this is a very valuable data to an interviewer. But you can use this in any conversation that you ever have to identify these critical indicators like this. And there, I think just this one clip, uh, I alone, and not even including these other guys here, I could do a, probably a, a three hour training on this one clip. Like we could spend a day oh, uh, dissecting easy. this thing. Easily. Yeah, yeah. that's all I got. The eyewitness is you. Okay, I know this sounds silly, mm -hmm. um, but it's probably the easiest way to start mm -hmm. um, is just to tell me what happened. And then so you can start what makes the most sense to you, and we'll just work our way through, and I'll pro I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions just to kind of clarify. Sure. So I know you talked to the initial patrol officer. Um, and, and he just got information. He didn't okay. say anything. Um, so, yeah, if you can just kind of tell me kind of what happened. It sounds like some of this may have started last night or something along those lines. Right. So start where you think it makes the most sense. Okay. So... Um, <laughs> I told you, it's a crazy question. Well, so we moved into this house three weeks ago because he offered to get me a house here where all my family is when okay. we were in Houston. And um, so he's like, we had decided to separate or whatever. So mm -hmm. we, he's like, well, I'll pay for a house for you and for JJ and whatever because he's all about JJ. He's never about Tylee, but he's all mm -hmm. about JJ. Mm -hmm. right? Because we adopted him together. He's okay. his great nephew. We adopted him as a okay. baby. And, and so we adopted him as a baby, and so we've been raising him together. And he travels all the time for business, so he's used to just going back and forth. So he's always gone, like, Monday through Friday. So he came when we first moved in and brought me stuff from Houston, like a U-Haul. And then he hasn't been back. But it's all these threats on my phone all the time, you know, like whatever, all these things. And then he told like, me... What kind of threats? Just... Uh, you'd have to read them to okay. see, but he's always mad at me, right? Okay. And he doesn't want a divorce, but I don't like him and don't want to deal with him, so <laughs> that's just how it is. So, yeah. so we married for 14 years, we dealt with him for 14 years, and him being horrible to her. Like, he gets in huge fights with her, he... Yeah, a lot of things, but okay. anyway. So he said, I'm coming Wednesday night, all of a sudden. I'm not, I want to see JJ, and I told him, I said, I will never keep JJ from you. Mm -hmm. You can come see him whenever you want to, come take him to school, whatever, like, I'm not going to do that. So I said, just go, and so he said, okay. So I gave him a backpack, he got in the car, this is his MO, right? He always leaves something in the house and comes back. He never leaves the first time. I always expect my husband to come back into the house, right? So I guess he had left his phone on the counter. So he initially left with the backpack and with JJ? And so then, he put them in the car, okay. in the driveway, and then he came back in, right? So I kissed JJ goodbye. He came back in, and his phone was on the counter, and I had his phone. And he was, like, giving me my phone, and I was like, why don't you show me your text that you've been texting, blah, blah, blah. 
you know, whatever, because he's like acting really weird, like he's plotting something against me. Like I'm like, why are you? Why are you even here? Like. What did you come here for, you know? He's been talking to my other brother, and my brother came into town at the same time last mm -hmm. night, and I haven't talked to my brother in a while, my other brother, and I was like, and so he was texting him on the phone when he first got to my house, and I'm like, why are you texting Adam? Like, do you even talk to him? Like, my other brother. And, um, you know, he's been telling me all these texts, like, you're going down, blah, 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 blah. He's blaming me for our marriage breaking up, and my niece getting divorced, and my friend getting divorced, he said, I'm a destroyer of families, okay. because I want everybody to get divorced. I'm like, what would my motivation be for people getting divorced, so I could babysit the kids more? Like, yeah. why would I have any control over what people do? Yeah. So, it's just very odd, but anyway, he goes, he goes nuts, he's gone nuts on us a lot of times. Ted and I have had to leave with JJ over the years, probably five times, and just stay in a hotel for two days, because... He goes nuts. Like, you don't know what's going to set him off. Like, whatever. And she's mad at me for always, like, going back. But we had JJ, and he's special needs, and it's really hard. Like, yeah. it's even harder to get her by yourself. So when you say he goes nuts, that's... All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, one of my favorite things about her whatever is those are bumpers for her. And by that, I mean when she's chaffing and going to change directions, pay attention. That whatever is her bumper. She goes, boom, hits that and turns. If you know that and you're interrogating somebody and go, whoa, 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 hold on a minute, whatever what, and just start poking them because she goes, whatever, blah, 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 back to the BLO, you know what I mean, from that 80s lyric, song lyric, because that's been something she's been successful with before. She can avoid conflict. She can do whatever it takes. This is a, again, I'm going to call this a modified form of chaff and redirect because she doesn't have a real plan where the chaff is going to take her and something to throw out that you'll pick up and run with. She proves that because at one point the woman asks her a question based on her chaff and she's like, oh, oh, and she stammers to answer it. So she's not chaffing and redirecting. She's chaffing until she gets the opportunity to say, this guy needed to be killed is basically what she's saying. She's running down the thing. And in the South, we would say, did I mention he needed killing? This guy might, that's, she just as well say that. She says he was dumb. He took the phone. He would always come back. Then they get in a fight about the phone. I, when she does whatever, blah, 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 she's avoiding something significant here, in my opinion. This is where that fight starts, and it's over that phone. Now, whether that's a setup or not, it's another story. She's locked down. She's in sacred space. And what I mean by sacred space is she has a barrier, a way of blocking something between you and me, and rubbing her hands or adapting as a way to release nervous imaging. That is creating space and taking control of the space with something you're comfortable doing. She starts to balance a good bit when she's talking about her brother, Adam. There's a lot of movement. Something's going on. Something has to go somewhere. Most of this has nothing to do with what happened. Almost everything she says is that. And then when she when she uh, when she says uh, when even when she's controlling the conversation, she's turtling. She's shrinking. We're seeing her baseline deviate. Pay attention. If you want to see what a baseline looks like, look at the teddy bear in the chair next to her. It doesn't change. Now, pay attention and compare her to the teddy bear over time and see who gets smaller. It's like a limbo contest between her and the teddy bear. Chase, what do you got? That's pretty good. Love that uh, analogy. And it, it, this word whatever seems to be her word for whenever she wants something to appear more detailed, but she's unable to add any any details mm. because they're probably not there. She's using forms of speech that are typically seen. So let's I'm giving you some behavior profiling stuff here, not just body language, but uh, some deep level behavior profiling. This speech that sh she's using is typically seen in trendy, uh, I would say, 20 somethings. We have what, uh, like whatever, vocal fry, up talk, and she's, I think, 46. These on their own don't show us much, but when you process this fully, you'll realize she's not a 20-something. She's give or take 46 in this clip. She tells us more about her behavior than most people will see here. And as an interviewer, seeing a 40-something use these trendy vocal behaviors, this tells us that she's vulnerable to social influence from popular young women online. As an interviewer, this lets me know she's strongly driven by social reward. This also means that she's strongly driven by the fear of social consequences of her actions. So I now know that this will be the most powerful reason as the interviewer for her not to confess or to or not to be honest in an interview with me because of this fear is going to be governing a lot of that. It's also the most powerful avenue that I can take when influencing her or getting her to confess. 
It's interesting, her denial of being the destroyal, destroyer of families, I think she uses, is about her lack of control instead of lack of desire. That hit me in the stomach pretty deep there. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. This is where we find out that she's the problem. And, and if if I was if I was talking to her, I would be under the assumption from this moment on, she started it, whatever it is that that the uh, encounter or the uh, engagement of this uh, fuss that started. Um, because she says she's she's checking his phone, looking for texts and stuff. And she goes on talking about how he's chasing her around and doing all this stuff. So she's the problem here. So she, I think, and I think like going back to your thing, Greg, was it something they said? I don't know if we talked about that before we started or after how maybe they set this up to, to make him mad. So he would do something and the brother would have, have a, um, a reason to shoot him or, or they would have reason for it to, to go full out like that. So what we're seeing is, is that, again, that a psychopath will show you you. Two of the things you need to be looking for as, as far as if she's a psychopath, one of the things we look for is how the emotion doesn't match with what's going on. Her emotions are all calm. There's nothing. In a few minutes, we're going to talk about shooting and stuff, and she's going to look the same way she does right now. She's going to be talking just like she's talking to somebody she sort of knows or just met is trying to impress. That's really important because at the same time, she's taken on that, or part number two, is she's taken on on the the voice tone and cadence of the interrogator. She's trying to be, she's trying to show her her. So this is this is a fantastic study in watching how one of these things works from the minute they start talking as they go through and even when she gets threatened in a couple of parts of this of this uh interview. She doesn't, you don't see it on her. She doesn't, she doesn't show it because she can't. There's no way to do that. You can make those, you can make them mad, but she doesn't get mad. She gets upset at being corrected, but I'm saying too much already. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, one thing that really interests me on this, when you listen to her story at the start, notice how she isn't responsible for stuff. It's a cascade of cause and effect where something else or somebody else causes something, there's an effect, and then that causes something else, and then this, and then this. And at no point is she there interjecting to go, and so I did this, and so I did that, and so then this happened. So, uh, you, you know, in, in Chase, maybe in your words she's trying to get across maybe the idea that she's not in control she doesn't have that uh internal locus of controlling or even external it's like she just isn't in control and she even says it she says well why would i have control ever what people do well as a mother you'd want a lot of control over what people do as, as a parent as somebody who lives in a home and has kids running around, you want a lot of control over what people do, or, or it is utter mayhem, unless you like complete mayhem. And I think she probably doesn't because I see how she's put herself together and she's pretty well put together. She certainly has enough control that she can exercise at the level to get that muscle tone that she has. A lot of discipline there, a lot of control there. So I think she's protesting too much. And therefore, I think I'm going to go to the opposite end. I'm going to say she likes a lot of control. I would say she wants to control as much as she possibly can. In fact, at the end of that, she has emphatic, symmetrical gestures. There's a smile for approval. There's then an eye block and then a pointing into self. So there's too much going on there to try and convince me that she has no control. I'm convinced all she wants is a lot of control. There, that's all I got on that one. All right, if you don't know who we are, we're the Behavior Panel. And I'm Scott Rouse, I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online body language course, Body Language Tactics, with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language, help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes. I did 20 years in the U.S. military, wrote the number one best-selling book on behavior profiling, influence, and persuasion. You can get training in that. Just type my name into your app store. Greg? 
Greg Hartley, I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor, written 10 books on body language and behavior, including one that's in the top 10 for business negotiation right now, the most dangerous business book you'll ever read, and put together the number one online body language tactics.com course with Scott Rouse. The eyewitness is you. So I said, just go. And so he said, okay. So I gave him a backpack. He got in the car. This is his MO, right? He always leaves something in the house and comes back. He never leaves the first time. I always expect my husband to come back into the house, right? So I guess he had left his phone on the counter. So he initially left with the backpack and with JJ? And so then... he put them in the car okay. in the driveway, and then he came back in, right? So I kissed JJ goodbye. He came back in, and his phone was on the counter, and I had his phone. And he was, like, giving me my phone, and I was like, why don't you show me your text that you've been texting, blah, 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 you know, whatever. Because he's, like, acting really weird, like he's plotting something against me. Like, I'm like, why are you, why are you even here? Like, what did you come here for, you know? He's been talking to my other brother, and my brother came into town at the same time last mm -hmm. night. And I haven't talked to my brother in a while, my other brother, and I was like... And so he was texting him on the phone when he first got to my house, and I'm like, why are you texting... Adam, like, do you even talk to him? Like, my other brother. And, um, you know, he's been telling me all these texts, like, you're going down, blah, 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 blah. He's blaming me for our marriage breaking up and my niece getting divorced and my friend getting divorced. He said, I'm a destroyer of families okay. because I want everybody to get divorced. I'm like, what would my motivation be for people getting divorced so I could babysit the kids more? Like, yeah. Why would I have any control over what people do? Yeah. So it's just very odd. But anyway, he goes he goes nuts. He's gone nuts on us a lot of times. Ted and I have had to leave with JJ over the years, probably five times, and just stay in a hotel for two days because he goes nuts. Like, you don't know what's going to set him off. Like, whatever. And she's mad at me for always, like, going back. But we had JJ, and he's special needs, and it's really hard. Like, yeah. it's even harder to get everybody so. So when you say he goes nuts, that I could take everybody. So. so when you say he goes nuts, that means that can mean a lot of different things. Right. So goes nuts like yelling and screaming. Yeah, goes yelling nuts and like screaming. Breaking like, things. Yes. Goes nuts like physical violence. He's never really, besides like grabbing us and pushing us, but not like punching okay. us or something. But he, with Tylee, he has gotten physical. Okay. Before and with my grown son. Like physical how? Like got into a physical fist fight with my son when he was 16. Okay. And he came after Tylee um, two times in Hawaii. Okay. And like went like he was going to hit her, but then I got in between them. Uh -huh. Right. How old was she when that happened? Um, probably 14, 13 and 14. Okay. Mm -hmm. um. All right, Chase, what do you got? This video really shows us why pronouns are so important. She's making the denial about a, aggression being against us. He didn't show aggression against us. So when you hear this and you want to ask a follow-up question, you should use the pronoun of a group instead of singular people. What did he do to you guys? And everyone was safe. Did he hurt you all? This is great instead of the singular stuff, and it helps this person to identify with the question and continue along their natural language pattern with their answers. And again... She's pointing to negative references on uh, one side while mentioning Tylee and him getting physical. And keep paying attention to this, and you're going to see something interesting emerge here in these clips. I think most of this was honest, and she's not skipping over a lot of words. Her body narration of the, the physicality of the interactions was clear and well-timed. It was demonstrated in what she was talking about. And that's kind of what we look for when someone... Or when we see somebody using their body to tell a story, those three elements right there. And we see that here. So I'm I'm thinking some of that physical interaction, some of the physical violence that she's describing there uh, actually did happen. And I think that's uh, probably real. Mark? Yeah, here's, here's a couple of areas that I have problems with, Chase. Two times in Hawaii, she says, and then there's a pronounced tongue jut. Now. Having said that, is it a tongue jut because of her distaste 
for the violence that occurred? Or is it a tongue jump because of her distaste for making up a story or a detail in the story? Maybe it was one time in Hawaii. Maybe it wasn't Hawaii, but there was violence. Listen, I'm not a mind reader. None of us are. So I don't know exactly. But I know there's an issue there of distaste somewhere around the two times in Hawaii. So were we in a position to do this, this, we might go back and we might ask again to try and work out what that distaste might be about. Uh, probably 14 or 13 uh, comes up. Then there's an eye block uh, a head where the head completely shades. It goes down. It doesn't go down into uh, emotion or memory. I think it's a, a true eye block. She just she doesn't want to look at the interviewer at this at, at this point. So again, around probably 13, 14, why, why the eye block around her child's age? My guess is it's not about the child's age. My guess is it's around the story about violence being perpetrated on the child. Now, am I saying that no violence was perpetrated on the child? I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea. But I know there's probably an issue around that somewhere. Could be an issue around the violence if it happened. Again, were I in the position... I might go back, I might ask again, now I know where to pinpoint on. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, we're gonna get a lot of people who say, you don't recognize that people who've been abused get X, Y, and Z. Look, that's not what any of us are saying. What we are saying, however, is there are patterns that we are seeing in a person's behavior deviating from baseline to this. And you'll see a cascade in this person. Chase, I think, yes, those pronouns matter in how you talk to the person because that's their choice of how they're organizing their thoughts, and that's powerful. However, in this case, I also think she's chosen these words to wrap herself in some kind of protecting other people. If he beat me up, that's one thing. But if he beat my children and his children and his adopted children and my cousin and Bob and the guy who shakes the bell at the at the, the um, what do you call the little guys here on Christmas? That guy. If he beats all those guys up now, if I hurt him, it's better than if he just slapped me one time and I shot him. So I think we have to be careful with people because they – we don't know what happens in relationships and a person salvation armies or whatever I was looking for, by the way, a person who is, who is doing all this thing and who may be in volatile relationships may play a part, but the other person plays a part too. So I, I, what I don't want us to do is take away from that. And I agree with you, Chase. I think whether this happened or she perceived it to happen, she looks genuine and honest because she's illustrating with her body. This is big Lori. Lori's personality is up now and she's talking. She's got her hands up. She does distaste at, he goes nuts. She does eye blocking. When she does that, Mark, it's when she's describing and, and repeating the questioner's words. She closes her eyes and she repeats her words, maybe to give her time to organize her thoughts. Not sure. There can be lots of reasons this whole thing happens, why volatility happens. We don't know anything about what's going on. We can't read their minds. But one of my favorite pieces of disapproval I've ever seen here is when she talks about her grown son, there's textbook pursed lips, closed eyes, and chin jut about him hitting her, her, her grown son. That may or may not be the crux of a lot of what's going on. Who knows? There's a lot of train wreck here. Scott, what do you got? All right. Now, continuing from the last video we watched to this one, she continues to persuade us, or, or, or us, but the uh, interrogator and whoever's going to be watching this, the, the videos of her interrogation and why she this guy was killed and why it's not her fault, and why he deserved to be killed. It's a guy named Robert Cialdini, and he wrote a book called uh, Persuasion. I suggest you check it out, because it's awesome. And he talks specifically about how you persuade someone uh, before you sell them, so try to sell them something, or when you try to make them like you or accept you, or in your job interview, those kinds of things. Fantastic book. It's called Persuasion, and that's what we're seeing here, because she's adding bricks to the pile of... Here's why he deserved to die. This is almost pre-confession, what she's doing here. She's telling us why she did it or why it was done if she did it. Has she already been uh, – is she already in, in – This case is not going to trial yet. Yep. Okay, well, then – then these are just my opinions. That's all it is. But I would assume that she's building this this big pile of bricks over here with each time she says he did something, um, The uh, this is why he deserved to die pile. So – but don't forget about persuasion. Now, her body language is st is starting to close up even more here. We see all the hallmarks of someone who's shutting down. We're seeing slumped shoulders, the turtling wind we've been talking about, vocal fry, her legs are still crossed. 
um, fading facts. And when you start giving the answers, they start getting quieter as you go along because your confidence is dropping because you may not be under the impression that that's true. As that's a, and her illustrators are diminished as well. They're getting smaller. Every time she's pre-suading, they get real big. But when she's telling something she's not sure about that she should be telling since she hadn't had time yet to structure her story perfectly or talk to her brother about this in detail, she's watching what she says. That's why she gets quiet. That's why she's starting to shut down because the deeper this thing goes, we're going to see the quieter and more shut down she becomes. Um, especially, and, and again, that part about I got between them um, – when when he was um, going to hit the hit the daughter, hit the little girl, she said, "I got I put myself between him." She's making herself the hero of this thing again, like you were talking about earlier, Greg, about being the victim, the victim is victimization of her as we're doing this. So this is all she's pre-suading the whole um, the outcome of this thing. With here are the reasons that he's a bad guy. Here are the reasons that he was shot or should have been shot. That's my opinion. My opinion only. All right, we good. Greg, I think you and I actually agree on that, in that if she is using those pronouns as a blanket, part of our job uh, in some parts of interrogation will be to help her build uh, that sure. blanket so we can rip it I, off. I, I agree with you, Chase, 100 percent. When they use those words, you use those words regardless of the reason, and then you get to the reason. I agree with you 100 percent. Yep, we're on the same page. Yeah. I just wanted, I wanted to clarify that for people watching because I knew we agreed. Oh, yeah. Yep. I, I wanted to make that distinction that we are – not doing that because we agree with her and we're doing it because we're helping her to build that. Yeah, that's a great, blanket. that's a great clarification. I think that's important. Yep. The eyewitness is you. I have to take care of So when you say he goes nuts, that means that can mean a lot of different things. Right. So goes nuts like yelling and screaming. Yeah, goes yelling nuts and like screaming. Breaking like, things. Yes. Goes nuts like physical violence. He's never really, besides like grabbing us and pushing us, but not like punching us or something but he, with Tylee he has gotten physical okay before and with my grown son like physical how like got into a physical fist fight with my son when he was 16 okay and he came after Tylee um two times in Hawaii okay and like went like he was going to hit her but then I got in between them uh -huh. right how old was she when that happened um probably 14 13 and 14 okay mm -hmm. um um so this morning he comes back in and... He comes back in, I wouldn't give him his phone. He was screaming at me to give him his phone. He was very worried about whatever was on his text mm -hmm. that he did not want me to see. And so I was just holding it there and he was screaming at me. And I was kind of walking towards around the house with it so he couldn't get it. He's like reaching for it and stuff like that. And so Tylee came out of her room upset mm -hmm. and she had a bat... And she told him to leave her mother alone, like, uh -huh. right? So she was really, whatever. And he's screaming at her, don't you hit me with that bad, blah, 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 blah. And then my brother heard all the commotion because he was in there in bed. And so he came out into the main room and um, I guess whatever. What's your brother's name? Alex. Alex, okay. Mm -hmm. And then um, he just started, he was screaming and he was super upset and whatever. And... Um, He's yelling at Tylee, don't you shut me with that bad, and blah, 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 and so Tylee, I guess, I don't know if she swung at him or what, but he, like, grabbed the bat from Tylee and then went to, like, hit Tylee with the bat. It was, and I was right there, they were right there, and my brother grabbed him from behind, mm -hmm. like, just to stop him from hitting Tylee. You go like this, like, he grabbed him, like... Yeah, from behind, like, uh -huh. just kind of to pull him back, uh -huh. and then, um... They got into the thing, and he's hitting him with the bat, and they're on the ground, like, grappling around or whatever. And then, um, I mean, that was all and he, quickly. And he hit your brother with the bat while they were grappling and stuff? Yeah, I, yes, he was hitting him with the bat, like, swinging the bat, you know, back and forth, and they were kind of, like, on the ground, and I was, like, freaking out trying to go around. Knowing JJ was in the car, Yeah. right, and so... Then he got up and he had the bat like this towards me and I was going around the other side to try to just get out of his range where he mm -hmm. couldn't hit me. And then um, I had told Tylee because she was like, on the ground because after he took the bat from her, she fell back. And so I told her, I was like, go get in the car with JJ. Like, I don't want JJ coming in to the house or, mm -hmm. and I wanted her out of the way. I wanted the kids out of the way, whatever this fight was going to be. And then, 
All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, uh, look, the description of the grappling that goes on, the the fight that goes on, they were kind of like on the ground or whatever. Well, it's a little little nondescript. I I would like a little more description on that, but maybe that's the only moment where it's a little nondescript, but it isn't because, and I've minimised the amount of fillers and nondescript words here. So I've minimized it. They happen again and again and again, multiple times. And there's some that I will have missed out as well. But we get and stuff like that was really and whatever, like, right, so, um, and then, and whatever, I guess, or what it was. And then no clarification of what it was. Look, All of this, if you have seen some kind of violent act go on, I understand that you can be traumatised. I totally get that. I understand you can lose certain memories, uh, but you're more likely to say, look, I just I just don't remember any of it. I'm 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 so shocked by it. I do not remember what went on. This is utterly nondescript. And therefore, I would suggest I wouldn't lay a lot of money on her on 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 her being very accurate about what went on here. Let's just say that. I wouldn't go to the casino and put down, in fact, any money. I wouldn't put down any money at this point that she's accurate about some of this. And I would start putting money on that she's going to be start to become even more deceptive and increase the deception. Of course, I can win. I could lose at the casino. Uh, I just don't think I'm going to lose uh, on this one. Scott, what do you got? All right. She has his phone and she won't give it back. It's his fault. She's still coming on like this is uh, this is this is this guy's fault. This is all persuading us to believe it that he's on started. Uh, she says that he chased her all over the house with it, trying to get the phone from her. He's chasing her all over the house. Is it? You know, I mean, come on, that's crazy. She's the problem here. If that actually happened, then she's a problem. If she was that freaked out by it, she would have dropped the phone and run or she would have left it there or not done that in the first place. And, but she's making him mad on purpose, going back to, to Greg's thought of the possibility of if this was set up, that that's where they're going to do it, get in there and trigger him real good, get him all worked up, and then shoot him and say it was in self-defense. She's really locked down here, and her uh, her illustrators are minimal. They're not very big, and they're really fast when they come out. So she's, she's not sure still. She's not totally confident with what she's going to say, but she's leaning into what she's saying. So that's we're, that's why we're seeing that juxtaposition of being locked down, but a lot of things going on at the same time. She laughs talking about a situation that's really violent. That involves her daughter. She laughs about that. Again, like psychopaths, like I was talking about earlier, if indeed she was one, the emotions don't fit the situation at all. Not even a little bit. She's she's seen something horrible. Talking about somebody going to who's going to hit her daughter with a baseball bat, and she's laughing about it. That's not right. That's not that's not right. That shouldn't be happening. And then when she talks about he was grabbed from the back, and he had the baseball bat, and her brother grabbed him from the back, but he was hitting him with it. How's he going to hit the guy with a baseball bat when he grabs him from behind? That's not going to happen. You can't. I, I I don't. I don't. Greg, is that possible? You're a big fighter. Yeah, you could hit somebody over your shoulder. Sure. Yeah. Like that, if you grab yeah, it, okay, and easily well, whack. Yep. Oh, okay, well, I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong about yeah, that. Swing it around and catch him with the back end of it. Even now, it's kind of yeah. Okay. All right. So after describing the, the this big fight and all this violent behavior, she smiles, and you know why she smiles? Because she likes that. That's really the only emotion that that a psychopath can can see or recognize is one of fear. So I'm sure she saw that, and that that the little feelings that they can feel, if they can feel anything at all. Would be, is that because she likes seeing that? That's why she's that's why she's smiling. I think throughout this, as she smiles when she talks about this horrible stuff, it's because she likes that. That actually brings the only feeling she may have is that excitement of something happening to give her an adrenaline rush, and so she sees that as pleasure. That's what she thinks is is pleasure in her mind. Like when they when people jump out of planes all the time and don't wear a parachute, you know, and they have somebody give it to them. You've seen those videos where that. Those people jump out of planes without a parachute. I think something's wrong with those people. That and those motorcycle people who drive those real fast down those little roads. I don't know if you've seen those on Instagram or not. That's crazy. Those people probably have amygdala problems as well. Uh, then she describes, uh, like uh, Juicy Smoulier, she describes something that didn't happen. I don't think they're in there wrestling around like that. I don't think that was happening. 
I think they went in, got him kind of mad and said, okay, that's it. And that, and then maybe the little girl came out with the bat and he ended up with the bat. But if you push some, if you get a bat away from somebody, I don't think they fall backwards. Wouldn't they, if you pulled it, when they come toward you, Who knows? right? Who knows? Okay. So there's no, man, my thing's on the fighting stuff. You can tell how often I'm out fighting. I'm, I'm not good at it. So <laughs> if you got a baseball bat, you're probably going to win if it comes to me. Um, so I'll leave it there. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, so uh, right away, uh, the interviewer makes a leading statement. He comes back in. So she does two things here, probably unintentionally. She lets Lori continue the sentence by letting her voice drift off. Second, she gets Lori into present tense by having her repeat a present tense statement to continue her story. She says Tylee came out of her room upset uh, and she had a baseball bat. Not she came out of her room holding a baseball bat or with a baseball bat, which is more fluent and more normal. Another negative GHT pointing to that negative side again of her body where she references negative things. And she, then she says she was really whatever. Every time I'm hearing this, I'm seeing a pattern developing here. She's assuming the whatever here and using blah, blah, blah as just fillers to suggest that there was so much more going on. I just don't have time to get into the details yet. I don't think this happened at all. And she also used this negative reference to refer to her brother, which might be different, but I doubt it. I only say it might be different because she uses her body a lot to illustrate stories. And if this did happen, maybe her brother was on her right side. So, uh, something is off in her description of the incident, the language, the action she's using, filler words. She's also uh, just waving them away with her hands, just just like this, like it's not a big deal. Uh, and, and this is different than any time she's moved for anything else for this one part of the story. And these pieces of data are likely false. I think they're all false. Greg? Yeah, so I always say when people speak, listen. Listen to what they say. Listen to how they say it. There's a key word in here. She says text. Go back and listen to that, how long that word is compared to every other word in the sentence. And what you'll hear is something is up. Something is tied to whatever text was on that phone, probably caused some kind of generation of some problem because it's over-exaggerated. The vowel is longer than any other any place else in the sentences we're hearing. My first note up here is how old are these people? You're playing keep away with a divorced or separated person's phone. Well, that's private property, first of all. Something's up here. This is not new for a person when they can talk about this casually. This kind of playing keep away with a person's phone is probably something that's going on in their life. When we talk about relationships, all relationships are about entitlements and expectations. People don't often state those in a relationship up front. Hey, I expect you to behave like an adult. And if you've never argued with irrational people, you have no idea what this is like. This is irrational. When a person's got your phone running around the counter and they're 46 years old, what the hell's going on in that relationship, first off? And it's somebody you're split from. So there's all kinds of crazy probably going on in this house that we don't get. I'll just start with that. There's a lot of adapting when she's talking about her keeping his phone. She starts fidgeting like all hell. And the questioner does a great job. Another really good kudo for this questioner. I could have sat across her and said, what the hell's wrong with you? You're a grown woman. This is his phone. Hand it back to him. And she would have lost him. What she's doing is if you read, if you're going to re use read method to go after him, you want to build up this whole disparaging the victim. You want to build up this whole undermining the victim. And she's letting her do it. I, I expected this to go somewhere else. And I think she does by the end. But you see that she's been illustrating up to now pretty big. And that's kind of slowed down. When she says she had a bat, talking about Tylee, upload, she had a bat. She makes hard eye contact and raises her forehead. No illustrators whatsoever. Wait a minute. You're really demonstrative with these illustrators. What about a bat? Why did that not come up? And so, Chase, I start to be with you. Did this really happen? This would be a great chance for her to do that. I would start asking questions about why she didn't do that. And then she hits what, whatever right at the end of that bat, a bat or whatever, and then ha, 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 she laughs. She laughs about this most horrific thing you've all brought up. And then her illustrators come back up because she's avoided that whatever that she was going to bring up and she's now moved on. So the nervous laugh is a release. You'll see people often do it when they get to a point. And then she guesses, says whatever again. And then the questioner interjects a well-timed question. Another great job by asking her brother's name to get her from going down whatever path which she was doing. If you ever seen a movie called American Graffiti, it's an American classic. Candy Clark plays this woman in there who is a ditz. 
this woman is a characterization of Candy Clark in American Graffiti. This rambling pieces of sentences that go nowhere. Then she goes back. Look, I, I, I'll just stop there. He was hitting him or swinging or what was he doing exactly? She just goes on and on. She reminds me of that Candy Clark character talking about the goat canal killer. Anybody who's a fan of that movie will know exactly what I'm talking about. It's just random, random, random. I'd be all over this. I think, Greg, the reason that she said text for so long, because it wasn't about the text. I don't think she was texting. I think she just grabbed his phone if she did, because... Like I was saying earlier, I don't. Th I think it's a, it's a juicy smooth yay. I don't. Th I don't think it happened like that at all. I think it's. I think like you uh, surmised at the beginning that it's made up, and she's just to get him triggered and, and get him all fired up. And, and you guys know I don't conjecture much. I was saying if it happened, how could it happen? Is how that conversation started because I don't usually say, "Hey, here's what I think happened in these things." Because I don't. I, there's way too much. There will be evidence. These guys will have all the forensics and all that kind of thing, and they'll know whether the guy was shot from behind, what kind of – there are all kinds of pieces that will come up in that trial that will be interesting for us to see. But, yeah, I, I think she gives us enough here to just say, what the hell? So the, when does that trial start? I know they chose jurors. In the, the no, no, that trial – the that. trial for the death of Tylee and J.J. is right now. It's ongoing oh, okay. right now. They've seated the jurors. This trial will not come up until after she's finished with the trial we're talking about now, which they expect oh, okay. to take 10 weeks. Yep. Okay, cool. The eyewitness is you. Um, so this morning he comes back in. And he comes back in. I went give him his phone. He was screaming at me to give him his phone. He was very worried about whatever was on his text mm -hmm. that he did not want me to see. And so I was just holding it there, and he was screaming at me. And I was kind of walking towards around the house with it so he couldn't get it. He's like reaching for it and stuff like that. And so Tylee came out of her room upset mm -hmm. and she had a bat and she told him to leave her mother alone, like, mm -hmm. right? So she was really whatever. And he's screaming at her, Don't you hit me with that bat? And blah, 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 blah. And then my brother heard all the commotion because he was in there in bed. And so he came out into the main room and, um, I guess whatever. What's your brother's name? Alex. Alex, okay. Mm -hmm. And then um, he just started, he was screaming and he was super upset and whatever and um, he's yelling at Tylee, don't you shut me with that bad and blah, blah, blah. And so Tylee, I guess, I don't know if she swung at him or what, but he like grabbed the bat from Tylee and then went to like hit Tylee with the bat. It was and I was right there, they were right there, and my brother grabbed him from behind, mm -hmm. like, just to stop him from hitting Tylee. You go like this, like, he grabbed him, like... Yeah, from behind, like, uh, just kind of to pull him back. Uh -huh. And then um, they got into the thing, and he's hitting him with the bat, and they're on the ground, like, grappling around or whatever. And then, um, I mean, that was all... And he quickly... <laughs> and he hit your brother with the bat while they were grappling and stuff? Yeah, I, yes, he was hitting him with the bat, like swinging the bat, you know, back and forth, and they were kind of like on the ground, and I was like freaking out trying to go around, knowing JJ was in the car, yeah. right, and so then he got up, and he had the bat like this towards me, and I was going around the other side to try to just get out of his range where he couldn't hit me, and then, um, I had told Tylee because she was on the ground because after he took the bat from her, she fell back. And so I told her, I was like, go get in the car with JJ. Like, I don't want JJ coming in to the house. Or, mm -hmm. And I wanted her out of the way. I wanted the kids out of the way, whatever this fight was going to be. And then... Um, Do you remember what your, your husband or your brother were saying or yelling during all of this? If they were at just all? Just kind of get off me, out, or whatever, you know, whatever, they were like, like, don't talk to my niece, that way. Yeah. <laughs> whatever, like, it was, I don't remember specifics, but they were kind of both, they were kind of in the heat of it, I don't think there was much, many words, many words. that I remember. Mm -hmm. So Tylee goes outside. Yeah, she was outside. And, and then what happened? Then he, they got up from that, and my brother had, like, stepped back, I guess, and, um, then Charles was coming with me at the back and yelling at me to give him his phone mm -hmm. still because I had it in my hand. It was all really quickly. Mm -hmm. And then um, when I went around kind of in the circle, then my brother was there. Um, 
When you said he, when you were going around and he was coming at you with the bat, mm -hmm. how was he holding the bat? Just like that, like backwards, almost in one arm. Like he was swinging, but like swinging it backwards. He would have done like like he would have swung it backwards at me, not frontwards. Okay, yeah. He had he was a base, professional baseball player. Okay. <laughs> so it wasn't a good idea for Tyler to get out of that. <laughs> Probably not the. I mean, he played semi pro. Yeah. When he was, yeah. <laughs> But, um. All right, Chase, what do you got? Her level of eye contact here is stunning while she's laughing about the situation. And I think she's probably been using this charm to get things her whole life. Here's why that should be scary to you. We know that adult behavior is shaped by what made the person get what they wanted earlier in life and what behaviors they needed to avoid punishment or consequences as a kid. And she's smiling here because she's used this in the past. But she's also, she's unaware that it's an inappropriate emotion to display. So what kind of person would spend a long time mastering facial expressions and making people uh, like them and also be completely unaware which emotions are socially appropriate? I'll let you be the judge. All the behavior you're seeing here might seem off. This is because you're seeing the signals of uncertainty, doubt, hesitation, and inward focus. Those four things are the things that we're seeing that might make you feel a little bit off. Uncertainty, doubt, hesitation, and inwardly focused uh, internal dialogue, so to speak. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, let's run down just a couple of things. And I'm going to pitch this one off to Mark pretty quickly. <laughs> but this woman's sitting there. Let's look at the teddy bear next to her and look at her now and look at how collapsed she's become. She's shrinking even more. She looks like the puppet next to her. Her arms are about to touch the floor. And somebody I know is going to talk about the grotesque plane, I have a feeling, as soon as we have this finished up. Her animation is gone. She's not talking. And I, I agree with you, Chase. She's like, oh, what do I say now? And where do I go? She's adapting to release nervous energy, even reaches up to an uncomfortable position to scratch. Um, there's internal voice, as she describes, and she's now changed planes. And what I mean by changing planes, when people are going up here and remembering things, now she goes down to internal voice and emotion and internal voice and emotion. We, as interrogators, know that she's headed into a place that we can push her a little further, and especially using all this disparaging the victim to get her to, to break, to get her to confess. Her voice tone is different. Her cadence is different. Her blink rate increases, even with that hard eye contact. When she does that, trying to understand the question, she opens her mouth. I see that, you know, I live in a part of the country where we make fun of people who hang with their mouth open when they're paying attention to something very tightly. We call it mouth breathing. I think she's doing a little bit of that as her circuits are heating up pretty hard. Mark, is this grotesque plane or is it just? This me? is very definitely gro gro grotesque plane. I, I, I also think she's got very long limbs as well. Her fingers are incredibly long as well. So she is long limbed, I, I would say. Uh, but having said that, I rarely see anybody manage to get their hands so low as they're talking that she's actually pulling up on the cushion and, and adapting on the cushion. Now, what does it mean to be in the in the grotesque plane? Well, certainly it means that gravity is getting way the better of her. She isn't winning that fight against gravity. It's bringing her shoulders right in. She's concave here. She's minimizing. I mean, it's almost like uh, like some kind of chimp there, <laughs> you know, so she's, she's almost dragging her knuckles on the ground. Uh, one last thing on this. Um, she says, you know, what were they yelling? Well, just kind of get off me. And then we see some asymmetry in the mouth, i.e. one side of the mouth does something different than the other side of the mouth. And we see a, a slight pull up in the mouth. Now, that could be uh, disdain or contempt. Um, but I don't know why it would be disdain and contempt. What is she disdaining or contemptuous of based on the text of it? So in asymmetry of the mouth, we're left with one other opportunity, really, which is, is it, um, is it Jupiter's delight uh, with her? Quite possibly is. Quite possibly she is enjoying the idea of making up a story here. So look, never seen this adaption on the uh, on a cushion down this low and she really has shrunk and heading 
further, further towards the ground, losing that fight against gravity. So even with somebody who may well be uh, psychopathic in nature, it doesn't mean that they don't have stresses on them. It doesn't mean that if they're put in a corner, they won't shrink and they won't have elements of fear themselves. And I think that's what we're seeing here. Somebody who doesn't feel much fear and has loves to have a great deal of control. But this is one of those moments, even for her, where she's caught in a corner. Scott, what you got on this one? I agree. She's caught in the corner. That's what's happening there. Um, at the beginning, she's talking about how they were yelling, and she, she had all these, oh, they were saying this and that. By the time she gets finished talking about it, she doesn't remember what they said. She 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 didn't really connect with what they said, as, as she explains to the interrogator, who's still doing a great job during this. And then, again, like you, like everybody's brought up so far, let's look at her posture. Man, she's so low, her hands are below that seat. You don't see that very often. You know, you know when someone's sitting there, that I think it might be the first time I've seen it on any of the things we've done uh, on this channel. The first time we've seen that, so that's really interesting. Again, we're hearing fading facts, more vocal fry, and way too much laughing when when she shouldn't be laughing. Her emotions are not uh, shouldn't aren't, aren't fitting with the situation that's happening there. What's interesting, I thought, and, and I figured for sure when you guys would would find this, her ego was hit on here. Did anybody see where that was? Where where something hit her ego? No. Okay, when she talks about him being semi-pro, I think that bothered her. I think that embarrassed her because we because she grabs her arm, and that's the first big adapter we see on her. That's the biggest one we've seen so far. And I think when she says oh, he was semi-pro, she wanted to be, him to be a pro, and I think that embarrassed her when she said that. Now, that's going way out there, but I think they're so sensitive. The psychopaths are so sensitive. They're so narcissistic. That that's something that didn't make her look as good as she could possibly look, and I think it bothered her. Now, keep in mind that when it comes to narcissism and psychopaths, a lot of people ask this question. All psychopaths are narcissists, but not all narcissists are psychopaths. So be sure you keep that in mind. Then get real close to it, and they'll seem just like them. That's why you can't. That's why I can't diagnose for sure this is a psychopath. But my goodness, she sure looks like one. Sometimes it takes six months to a year to be able to really find out if someone is or not without all the MRI work and you know, with all the brain fMRI work on the head. But um, that's one thing to keep in mind. So that's what I thought. I thought that that it it sort of hit her ego there when she had to say it was semi pro. And that's why we're seeing that adapter on her hand there, on her forearm there. All right. We good? Mm -hmm. Yep. Excellent. All right, Mark, you had no competition in that whatsoever. You yeah, win. Chase did a lean out good. Towards, the, towards the trophy cabinet of the back. Trying to find a charger. <laughs> How confident he is. The eyewitness is you. Do you remember what your, your husband or your brother were saying or yelling during all of this? If they were at all? Just kind of get off me, ow, or whatever, you know, whatever, they were like, like, don't talk to my knees about whatever, yeah. <laughs> whatever, like, it was, I don't remember specifics, but they were kind of both, they were kind of in the heat of it, I don't think there was much, many words, many words. that I remember. Mm -hmm. So Tyree goes outside. Yeah, she was outside. And, and then what happened? Then he, they got up from that, and my brother had, like, stepped back, I guess, and, um, then Charles was coming with me at the back and yelling at me to give him his phone mm -hmm. still because I had it in my hand. It was all really quickly. Mm -hmm. And then um, when I went around kind of in the circle, then my brother was there. Um, when you said he, when you were going around and he was coming at you with the bat, mm -hmm. how was he holding the bat? Just like that, like backwards. Else like he was swinging, but like swinging it backwards. He would have done like like he would have swung it backwards at me, not frontwards. Okay, yeah. He had he was a base, professional baseball player. Okay. <laughs> so it wasn't a good idea for Tyler to get out of that. <laughs> Probably not the. I mean, he played semi pro. Yeah, when he was young. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, and then I was kind of turned around. And we were all right there in that room, except for the kids had been outside by that time, and I heard the gunshot. Mm -hmm. And so you heard the shot. Mm -hmm. Did did you actually see 
see the shot, or did you just hear it? I had gone around mm -hmm. to the kitchen to get away from him, and so back around. So I don't know if you went in the house. I didn't, so I'm like so, a little bit of a disadvantage. Yeah, so I didn't see when... I didn't see the shot, it hurt, and then I came back around and I saw that he was on the ground. Okay. And I was freaking out. Yeah. And so I was just freaking out and it just went into mama. I'm like, I've got to go to get JJ to school, I've got to get to the kids. I just felt like, i got to get to the kids. Mm -hmm. And so I just went outside and to see if they were in there okay. I didn't want them coming back in the house when all that was going on. And, and um, got Gigi in the car and he was trying to come in mm -hmm. and Tylee was like looking at me with like the crazy eyes like what just happened and I told her to get in the car and we're going to take Gigi to school mm -hmm. and I just left. <laughs> All right Mark what do you got? Uh, yeah, so did you hear the shot or did you see the shot? Or it's you know, some question along those lines. And there is a pause after that that I believe is way out of the baseline. I mean, it's not a great long pause in the grand scheme of pauses that you've ever heard in your life. But, you know, notice how rapidly before she was delivering information. And right now she takes a long time before she then gives really quite a convoluted answer there of 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 why she would be there but not quite there to see the shot this is clearly important it's clearly important that she helps people understand that she maybe didn't see anything but only hear anything she's not fully in that location in fact she wants distancing from the whole thing she says all that was going on well, all that, what I can see was all that is somebody has definitely fired a weapon and there's somebody on the ground. So let me just assume somebody's been shot and in her mind, that's all that. So that's clearly distancing. She wants not to be attached to what's gone on here. And then in fact, uh, she says, look, I, I, I then um, wanted to get the kids to school. I just left. She's already said that's her mum, her mom mode. So she's giving a, re saying it's reasonable when somebody's shot and uh, and somebody's on the ground or if the gun goes off, and there's somebody on the ground uh, that you'd want to get the kids to school because you're in mum mode. You don't want them in that house. No, I get that, but you don't have to get them to school. I mean, just away is, is good. Uh, so I'm very concerned about this story. It doesn't make a great deal of sense. It looks like she's trying to distance herself from everything as carefully and as quickly and as boldly as she can. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, this is a really good one because she's adapting and barriering. You know, she's closing up and then fidgeting. And what I always mean by that is when a person's barriering, they're making space for themselves. That's innate. That's human nature. We put things between us. Often women will cross her abdomen or primary sex organs in high stress. And then they'll start to mess around, play with their fingernails or hair, something, or fidget with their fingers and rub on their arms. It's a way to release nervous energy and make yourself comfortable because you're creating a known environment behind that barrier. She also has a cadence change again, back to the one about the bat. Remember the bat. She said the bat, and she does it here when she talks about the gunshot. There's a lilt up. Her brow goes up, hard eye contact. So she's asking for approval. That's twice, twice around a bat and around the gunshot. That's interesting. Does it mean anything? Maybe, because it's different from everything else. Did you see or hear? She avoids the question for 15 solid seconds. I counted it. 15 seconds. She avoids the question by talking about, and I walked around this way and walked around that way. Have you been in the house? Well, that is chaff and redirect. She's working hard to get her off the topic. Now there's a second uncomfortable laughter, really big laughter compared to most of what we've seen. We've seen smiles and awkward, but this is a laughter. And then Mark, I'm with you. Oh my God, this guy's lethal injured. Well, the kids need to go to school. No 911 call, no police, nothing. Let's just go. Let's just go. Look at her hands now. Look at where they're at. And then at the very end, when she says, I just left, there's another laugh. That laugh is powerful. And there's a half smile of contempt or derision. That has to be about somebody. Is it about her brother? Is it about her children? Probably about the guy laying in a puddle on the floor would be my guess. But Chase, what do you got? Yeah, let's talk about a couple of phrases she says here verbatim. The first one is, except where the kids had been outside by that time. That's word for word. 
absolute loss of fluency, hesitancy, unusual body narration. Second statement, she says, when I heard the gunshot in, and that's it, in, that's it. So this, and then this is also loss of fluency, hesitancy, all that. But right here we have staccato gesturing, which is like this little weird kind of staccato method of gesture. And you'll see that here and you won't see it anywhere else pretty much because this is out of her baseline. When she gets the question, did you see the shot? This is not a question that you have to think about or process or mull over or consider. But she definitely does all, maybe all of those things. So this is a non-answer statement. There's a loss of fluency, a shift to past perfect language. And I would say this is likely 100% deception, very likely. Uh, the loss of fluency is apparent now, probably to everyone watching. But there's one thing her body does here after she's describing this, hearing the shot. Her arms flop and fall down uh, onto the chair. I've seen a lot of people doing do this. I, I can't perfectly explain what it means, but I think it's an unconscious attempt to look relaxed uh, and stressed out at the same time. Uh, she sees a murder and thinks, I've got to get JJ to school. You guys mentioned this, but this alone, I think, should tell you all you need to know. If you look more closely at this, you'll see a person who is not able to lie about a situation in a way that a normal human would. She's unable to fabricate what an appropriate emotional response would be to this event. So she assumes that this is what most people would be thinking in this situation. So she's offer, offering up this reaction to show you how she responded. So what is missing here? I always ask this question when I'm watching these videos. What's missing? What's missing here that 100% of people would have described having just witnessed a murder? And I'll leave the answer to that question up to you. you put it in the comments. That's all I got. Scott? You're right. I don't think she was in there. She wasn't in there. When, there, when a gunshot goes off in a room, you remember it, and there's no pause. Did you hear or see it? Did you see did you see the gun? Because when a gun comes out, everybody looks at the gun. Everybody. And your eyes don't leave that gun. You want to make sure it's not pointing at you. And when it goes off, you never forget how loud that is. Because when it goes off, you hear a whistling right after that. And it, especially if you're in the same room, it gets loud. And I promise you, everybody's looking at that point who shot who. Even though you know that person has got the gun, they're going to shoot everybody. You still look at him. You still look at that gun. That's where the danger is. Your brain makes you do that. You can't help it. Now, the re that's so that's the reason she waits for that long pause because she hasn't talked to her brother about this yet. I think, and I know Greg, you hate it when or you don't do this. I think she left, and that's when he did it, and he called her when it was over. That's what I think happened. That's why it got so weird right there. Because when that, and I'm go, I'm jaded, so probably. But that's the road I go down because that's what I would start asking her questions about at that point. So I I think they went in there and and she got them all worked up. She left. She she hits the road, and this guy tags him. That's that would be my my assumption at this point. If I was if I was talking to her, that that'd be the road I went down right there. Um, and then as she talks, let's see, well, I've covered all that. Let's see. Um, oh, then she says uh, she took the kids away from the scene because she knows it's a crime scene. It's a murder scene. Who Have you ever heard somebody say, oh, yeah, we're going out to McDonald's. We left the scene. And uh, went to, unless you're it's in the 60s or something, and people talk about the scene, but it's not the 60s. And she talks about leaving a, a crime scene. That's what she said. So I think that's where she messed up as well. That's Scott, one of the reason I, yeah. That's that's seven, video seven. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Sorry. Oh, I'm yep. glad you told me that. I've got it on We all have those same here. notes, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, um, we didn't watch the whole video this time, you guys. That's why I'm talking about that. So I'll save that part, and, and I'll try not to go over it in our next set of videos, in our next video. Thanks for telling me that. So I didn't just waste my whole thing there. I've got six Bs, so I marked it wrong. I've got a good one on the scene thing. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Okay. The eyewitness is you. Yeah, and then I was kind of turned around. And we were all right there in that room, except for the kids had been outside by that time. And I heard the gunshot. Mm -hmm. And So you heard the shot? Mm -hmm. did, did you actually see, see the shot? Or did you just hear it? 
I had gone around mm -hmm. to the kitchen to get away from him and so back around. So I don't know if you went in the house. I didn't, so I'm like so, a little bit of a disadvantage. Yeah, so I didn't see when, I didn't see the shot, I heard it, and then I came back around and I saw that he was on the ground. Okay. And I was freaking out. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was just freaking out and it just went into mama and I'm like, I've got to go to get JJ to school, I've got to get to the kids. I just felt like, i got to get to the kids. Mm -hmm. And so I just went outside and to see if they were in there okay. I didn't want them coming back in the house when all that was going on. And, and um, got JJ in the car and he was trying to come in. Mm -hmm. And Tylee was like looking at me with like the crazy eyes, like what just happened? And I told her to get in the car and we're going to take JJ to school. Mm -hmm. And I just left. <laughs> Came back in and you saw him on the ground. Where was your brother? Did you see him where he was at? Yeah, he was right in front of him. Okay. Like it all happened very quickly. That right. was. I mean, I was. I feel like I was there because I was right there, like yeah. a second later. Like, okay. I just went around the kitchen to get away from him. Did your brother say anything to you at all? Do you remember? No, we were both just in shock. Okay. Like it was just a. I mean. I didn't say anything. I went out with the kids just to check on them first, and I was gonna come back in maybe, uh -huh. but I didn't. I was like, I just have to get him to school okay. and call the police and come back, you know, whatever. Did anybody say any, did you, you or your brother say anything at some point about calling the police or calling 911? Do you remember? Yeah, he called me. Okay. And he said, are you taking Gigi to school? Uh -huh. And I said, yeah, we need to call the police. And he okay. said, okay. Okay. So you, he called you when you didn't come back inside basically? Right. Okay. Because I was like, in the car for a minute, and then I was like, "What do I do?" Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I didn't want JJ to go inside, and I didn't, okay. I didn't know what to do. And Tyler was freaking out. I was trying yeah. to get them away from the scene. Let's see if I keep my cards straight this time. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is an interesting one, and we'll talk about the scene. Each of us will talk about it a little bit differently. Let me just give you the simplest version of being an interrogator, and somebody uses the word "the scene." There's options. Do I jump in? And, well, well, hold on, hold on a minute. What does the scene mean to you? Or do I leave it until later to constrict the person? And I use that word later. But either way, I would call that a push-pull word. I use them all the time. When I hear something, I may opt to throw a hurdle in front of the person so they have to work damn hard to get over it and cause them to stumble. Or I may use it later in much a Colombo method where I start to constrict around them and tighten the, tighten the noose. So here's the most interesting of all these things. There are three or four pieces to this one. They're great. Scene is one. Where was your brother? Yeah, he was right in front of him. Yeah, there was no 15-second ramble now. Now, yeah, just walk back around there. Now, this is just contradicted what she said two minutes ago. There's block number two, so we can start using that. The answer is so much shorter, and now she was there. Is this an in incremental in admission of involvement? We're really good at that. We like slippery slopes. Once we start and you start saying that, now the disparage the victim. Look, I, I got it. I get it. He was trying to hurt everybody. You had to rush to protect. Now you start to minimize. Now this starts to affect. In, in intelligence interrogation, where you're not trying to get a confession, we use love of, hate of, that kind of thing. We'd say, you know, you're justified in doing it. He did something wrong. And we're not after getting a confession. We're get, after finding out facts. But listen to the change in the baseline. When she does, I just got to get the kids to school. I didn't want to call the police. And she's in grotesque when she's doing that. When a person's lilting up, I expect, Mark, they're in passion or truth. They're up here. They're, they're, they're negating the effects of gravity. She isn't. It, and then just that piece to say scene, how do you reconcile that with an ordinary speech? I haven't heard that word anywhere else. Chase, what do you got? I agree with you. Wholeheartedly agree. And right at this moment, did your brother say anything to you at all? This moment of absolute silence is her careful consideration of, A, the brother's story. They haven't maybe made up something together. But it's a careful consideration of what normal people would do in this situation. She's processing what might happen if one of her friends had experienced this story. And I'm willing to bet that she's heard this line about being in shock from a friend or from television before. And that's stuck with her. And what's being asked uh, when she's being asked about uh, calling 911, take a look at her hands. They go into what's called palm exposure. 
So they're exposing the palms. This is what we see innocent people do. And she's unconsciously replicating this behavior. Her brain's processor speed is then going up so fast to keep up with the story and this question that her brain is doing what all brains do. It's conserving energy to conserve processing power of the brain. It freezes the body so that there's more resources to use for the story. You'll see this when somebody suddenly has some really great deep thought and they have to think about it. They'll stop. They'll just their body will stop so they can process everything. And they'll be still for a moment. And it's usually a sudden stillness, which is what we're seeing here, too. So the hands get stuck in this position while the interviewer continues to ask a couple of questions. And one final point, uh, I think she's potentially, we all maybe have different takes on this. I think she's using the word seen because she's heard it in police shows by people who are dispassionate about the, the crime scene, but she doesn't know they're dispassionate. She thinks this is the normal way that people talk about where a killing has taken place is just a scene so she just calls it a scene because it's not an important emotional thing for for her uh scott what do you got yeah okay i'll agree with that that goes along with, plus it goes along with mine um th- what she's talking about this is crazy talk this doesn't sound normal on no matter what planet you're on it doesn't sound right um she wasn't in shock of, and, and thinking you know um I got to get the kids to school. She was thinking, okay, now what? If she was there, I don't think she was there during that. That's again, going back to my thing earlier, that that's why she was, she doesn't know what to say. There's why is that, that long pause. She hadn't talked to her brother yet. They don't have their story together yet. That's why you separate them to make sure they don't talk and get their story happening together. So I, I don't think she was in there. Um, and then she and when she says, uh, did you see the shot? She just deflects. I think she just, she's just, she goes off into dang, uh, at, in the last video, goes off into dang nowhere, talking about other stuff. It has, you know, that, that just makes no sense whatsoever. This whole thing right here, it's, it's really confusing because she doesn't know what to say. And we're trying to piece this together and say, why does this make sense? Why doesn't this make sense? It doesn't make sense to us because it doesn't make sense to her. She hasn't had time to, to get her story worked out. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So we were both in shock and, The gestures that she's doing there are what I would call contra gesture. She's doing the contrary to exactly what you should do and would do in a state of shock. Now, what would you do in a state of shock? I can, I can allow you to find out. It's going to be a little bit weird, but after this show, uh, take all your clothes off and get in a cold shower. Let it run icy cold. Okay. Okay. And just walk into that cold shower. And I want you to notice what happens to your muscle tension. What you'll notice is your muscles tighten up and you can't stop it. Yeah. Cause your brain stem is doing that. You cannot countermeasure that. Well, you, you can, but if I surprised you with the cold sugar, the, 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 the cold shower, you wouldn't be able to countermeasure it. So you, your muscles are going to tense up and also your hands are going to come up and your elbows are going to come in to protect your, your your delicate organs and also to keep you warm. That is shock. So you've got tension in your uh, in your muscles and you're coming up to what I would call the passion plane up here. So you might come up even closer up into closure or disclosure here as, as it's hitting your face. Now, what's she doing? Her muscle tension is in no tension at all, zero tension. That's why her hands are hanging flaccidly down and her gestures are not in passion. They're in the grotesque plane. So no tension, almost like a, a, a newly uh, collapsed body in the arms and that and and gravity taking hold of that. It's the exact, it's what you do if you were like super relaxed. It's exactly what you do if you were sitting on a beach with some kind of pina colada and you couldn't even be bothered to pick up the drink because maybe you got somebody who's going to do it for you. That's the kind of tension state and gesture plane that she's in. And she's talking about we were both in shock. It's contra gesture. You rarely see that. You rarely, rarely see that. There it is for you. Beautiful moment. Uh, but we got something even more extraordinary coming up. So stick with us. There. That's all I got on that one. You guys, those of us who've been around where people have been shot, do you remember what that was like? Sight, smell, all that kind of stuff. You remember what it's like? You never forget that. 
Now imagine you're a person in your own kitchen and somebody's killed. I don't, I have no idea where they got shot. Let's assume it's the head. That's a hell of a lot of blood, a hell of a lot of blood. If it's not the head, then it's a slower, much more impactful death. I expect to see things like, and I'm not projecting onto her. Every person's different, but most people are going to show signs of disgust from the smells and the sights and the sounds of pain of something, of some emotion. None of that. None of that. Scott, that may support your theory. Yeah. Yeah. And how loud it was. Mm. They always talk about how oh, loud yeah. it was. Have you ever was. shot a gun in the house, in a building? <laughs> you never yeah. forget it. You know what, Greg? A Even car. if you had very little empathy, you would be upset at the mess. Yeah, exactly. Just yeah, the general, I mean, like, disgusted. my wallpaper, yeah. like, that was expensive. You know? Exhibit A, the psychopath. <laughs> right. The eyewitness is you. Came back in and you saw him on the ground. Where was your brother? Did you see him where he was at? Yeah, he was right in front of him. Okay. Like, it all happened very quickly. That right. was, I mean, I was, I feel like I was there because I was right there, like, yeah. a second later. Like, okay. I just went around the kitchen to get away from him. Did your brother say anything to you at all? Do you remember? No, we were both just in shock. Okay. Like, it was just a, I mean... I didn't say anything. I went out with the kids just to check on them first, and I was going to come back in, maybe, uh, but I didn't. I was like, I just have to get him to school okay. and call the police and come back, you know, whatever. Did anybody say any, did you, you or your brother say anything at some point about calling the police or calling 911? Do you remember? Yeah, he called me. Okay. And he said, are you taking JJ to school? Uh-huh. And I said, yeah, we need to call the police. And he okay. said, okay. Okay. So you, he called you when you didn't come back inside, basically? Right. Because okay. I was, like, in the car for a minute, and then I was like, what do I do? Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I didn't want JJ to go inside, and I didn't okay. I didn't know what to do. And Tyler was freaking out. I was trying yeah. to get them away from the scene. <laughs> away from the scene. Understandable. Mm-hmm. Um, do you, I don't, and you may not know this, mm-hmm. so, because I know you heard the shot. Do you know at what point your brother had the gun? Do you know if he had it when they got in their first fight, or did he have to go get it, or do you do you know that at all? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. And do you remember if you ever heard your brother? I didn't see him ever leave the room. Okay. So. It was, it was so fast. All that was so fast. Like, yeah. I'm on the ground, rolling around, and I'm screaming. And This probably happened in a couple seconds. Yeah. I mean, it was, like, super fast. Um, and I don't know if you know this or not. Does your brother normally carry a gun? Like, I carry a gun everywhere I go. Right. Like, so, I know he's a gun person. Like, okay. he has guns and things. Okay. He's good with guns. <laughs> did you know that he had one with him? No. When he came over? No. Okay. But I wouldn't be surprised if he did. Because okay. he's very very professional with kind of proficient professional mm-hmm. um i responsible is usually a good right but i responsible with guns. Um, and then do you re- all right greg what do you got hey, you know the only thing i would like to see different here is for her to hold her arms out like this kind of like the teddy bear so we could compare them more effectively <laughs> but her arms are down like the teddy bear it makes me kind of giggle when i look at it so it's kind of funny. She's adapting now. She's even scratching down lower on her leg. When she asked one of the questions, the person stops. And you can tell that she's starting to go to internal now. And what I mean by internal, when we get a person to confess, typically what we get them to do is to go behind their face and start working. Our job is not complete until they get in there and start working. And then we let them work and they bring back the answer to us. Good interrogation is about getting the person into internal voice and internal conflict. So they have to figure out the only way for me to get out of this is X. That's futility and that works wonders. This questioner almost got it. I mean, she got her to a point where she asked her a question and then she kept talking. She should have said, been very quiet and let her talk, but that's okay because Valo's brain is working like we expect behind the face now. And she continues to give her even more details, even after she interrupts her with a question. See that self-soothing as she's an internal voice. And we say, when you're looking down to your left, you're an internal voice. She's trying to figure out what to say. She turtles, meaning she shrinks in her body. She adapts and barriers again. She's rubbing and she eye blocks when she's talking about her brother and the guns. Why? That's new. That's new. Her brother and the guns. Did he have a gun? Did he go get a gun? Oh, he's a gun person. 
This is back to like his phone. This is back to the key elements. If I were looking for key elements of the story right now, I'd say phone, bat, gunshot, brother had guns. Those are four places. There's some major deviations. And if I were building a case, those would be part of my case. Scott, what do you got? Yeah. And I would add all this stuff about her not being in my, in my theory about her not being there because it's just too, it just doesn't add up, man. I don't think she was in there. Uh, now let, 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 we'll go past all that and talk about um, the gun. You know, when you're talking about guns, being a, a responsible gun person, that's not funny. When we, t- when we talk about guns, we don't go, yeah, you got to be. Res-. No, because it's a, it's serious business. You, there's no joking around when it comes to guns. You can talk about, you know, um, how good somebody is when they're at the range or something like that. And you can mess with somebody about that. But when it comes to being responsible with a weapon, that's not funny. Not even a little bit. You have to be very serious about all that. And when that interrogator corrects her and she says, um, being responsible, not not professional, all that, she doesn't like that. That brushes up against her ego. That's how sensitive that this, if she was a psychopath, is because she doesn't like that. So that's when that's when we see her. Um, so she, she, she starts tightening up again. She doesn't like that at all. Not even a little bit. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I think there's something more on these these guns. Uh, guns and things. So I would like, like to know what the things are, uh, because, because maybe the things aren't other things. Maybe that's a mindset. It's possible that the guns and things is, is, a, is, is she alluding to a way that he might use weapons, that he might be more violent if he's done the shooting that the that the things are more than just you know he's got guns and holsters and bullets to put in there but there's a way a way about him and then she goes on to say uh maybe proficient but then maybe turns it into professional again both which are unusual words maybe to use around that because as the interviewer says well maybe you're thinking about responsible the interviewer kind of helps out a little bit on there and then she closes up around that the hands close up one the arms close up one one uh uh, hand goes underneath uh she she's more concave in her body and she eye blocks i wonder whether the brother has been outed a little bit here maybe the brother is heavily into guns or if not heavily into guns um is 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 violent in nature i mean if he shot the guy then and and unpro- and relatively unprovoked uh probably is violent in nature look i don't know i just think it's quite interesting that we get a big baseline change there around uh professional proficient and responsible now as you say scott the baseline change might be about her being uh narcissism being triggered there and corrected around something although it's quite quite big i wonder whether the story is collapsing a little bit there uh, chase what you got on this one you all hit a bunch of stuff uh, that i had here but this aside from this this is a wonderful combination of self-soothing and shutter speed self-soothing is to calm herself down you'll see it on her leg and the shutter speed is what you're seeing here when her brain's trying to process how she's going to answer this question as the question's being asked you can see it it's rare uh, given everything that you guys have talked about it's really rare i'll go all in on something being deceptive this is one of the closest i've ever seen to me going all in this is like a hundred percent the next thing you're seeing in this clip is discomfort with unknown information this is a big deal Guilty people are usually thinking that if they can't come up with information when asked, then they're going to be caught. As a result, they're going to try to over-deliver on the unknown information or the information that they're pretending not to know. In their subconscious, this is how they can appear helpful and informative uh, to, to the interviewer. I'm going to just try to give you all kinds of stuff. Innocent people will just say, I have no idea. That's all I got. Greg. Yeah. The eyewitnesses, you. Oh, we 
from the scene. Understandable. Mm -hmm. um, do you, I don't, and you may not know this, mm -hmm. so, because I know you heard the shot, do you know at what point your brother had the gun? Do you know if he had it when they got in their first fight, or did he have to go get it, or do you, do you know that at all? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. And do you remember if you ever heard your brother? I didn't see him ever leave the room. Okay. So, it but, was so fast. All that was so fast. Like, yeah. I'm on the ground rolling around and I'm screaming. And This probably happened in a couple seconds. Yeah. I mean, it was like super fast. Um, and I don't know if you know this or not. Does your brother normally carry a gun? Like, I carry a gun everywhere I go. Right. Like, so, I know he's a gun person. Like, okay. he has guns and things. And okay. He's Did good you with guns? <laughs> Did you know that he had one with him no. when he came over? No, but okay. I wouldn't be surprised if he did, because okay. he's very, very professional with kind of Proficient, professional, mm -hmm. um, I, responsible is usually a good Right, but I'm responsible with kind of um, right. and, and then do you remember if uh, at any time so you were trying to get away from him, right. and you heard the shot. Prior to the shot, do you remember at any point hearing your husband or your brother saying anything to any either of them? No. Um, so my second very ridiculous question mm -hmm. is, is there anything else that I didn't ask about or anything that we didn't cover that you think is important? Um, I always ask that just because I wasn't there and so we're right, going through right. something that happened right. a super small amount of time. Yes. Can I so, <laughs> yeah, go for it. Just thinking. Mm -hmm. Just that, um, he was just so angry, like super scary. Did you, you know how you take your phone away from like a 16 year old uh -huh. and you freak out? Uh -huh. Like their world disintegrates. Like I've taken my phone away from a 16 year old boy before and uh -huh. he like, it's like wanted to kill itself because yeah. like they cannot function. That's how it was. It was like, is something on his phone that he does not want me to see that uh -huh. he was like freaking out, mm -hmm. like to the point where I thought he would hit me in the back of the head to get the phone. Okay. So you thought. It's All right, Greg. What do you got? Yeah, we're back to small Lori again. She has the threat identified. Her eyes are locked. And we call that Romancer and True Crime Workshop, but it's simply paying all attention so you make sure you don't lose any opportunity to convince the person. She adapts to a leg bump at specific questions. Her blink rate is through the roof. She's shrinking and turtling more. She goes to internal voice when she's asked one of the best questions an interrogator can ask. Is there anything else you should tell me? That's a beautiful question and one that professionals all use. Precisely where or where she should be, though, is this emotional act, this accessing when she's doing it. So there's nothing wrong with her going to an internal conversation than emotional accessing. Then she goes in this weird little meditation pose, which is just odd as it can be. I'm always a fan of people doing weird stuff because it gives me insight into their personality. But then she goes into what we typically, you know, the old days, you would have called a kinesthetic plane where you're not doing visual or auditory um, accessing. You're just down here in emotion and internal voice. She's behind her face working. She's doing our job for us. You never want to bother that. You want to let that person do it. Then when she asks her questions and she pokes her a little, she goes to front of mouth talking. We said, just thinking, um, and fading facts. She Here's another, disparage, disparage the victim. She goes at him, and then she lowers her head and looks at her in data intake. We've got her behind her face. I thought this might actually turn into an interrogation instead of it just being a questioning. It's pretty nice. Chase, what do you got? Yeah. So, Greg, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hammer down hard on this yoga pose for a second. Yeah. So for you listening uh, and all this, our, our subscribers, I want you to watch this again, and I want you to – 
just try it on through my eyes. When you watch this again, here's what I want you to see. This question she asks about, is there anything else I didn't you know, ask you that I should have? It's a common question in all interviews. Somehow, I don't know why, but this question makes the interviewer feel slightly socially awkward. The interviewer is actually couching, qualifying, and explaining her reasoning for asking this question. She gets a little bit nervous asking this question. And the moment that Lori sees this insecurity and nervousness, her entire being changes. She develops self-confidence in one second in the presence in the uh, the presence of insecurity here. And you can see her entire body shift. She's no longer protecting her abdomen. She sits up, takes this confident posture, and looks like a completely different human being. You're seeing someone who becomes confident the moment she's made someone feel or observes a person being socially awkward about asking questions. And I'll just leave you with that to decide what that means. But I want you to see that so that you'll recognize it in your life if you ever encounter someone similar to this. You get embarrassed and they start acting more confident or you feel bad and they start acting more confident. That's a big deal. The rest of this ch uh, clip, it's just covertly emotionally justifying the gunshot uh, wound to a person who feels emotions. And I think she believes she's going to go home. And I think she believes this will all be over soon. And she's going to go home and, and have some dinner. Uh, that's all I got. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, here's what I got. I think this is the biggest change in baseline I've ever ever seen the only thing that might be as big is there's one interrogation out there or interview out there where they leave the room and the and the subject stands on their head i can't remember who it is now but it, jody arias okay jody arias, jody arias. Uh, which that's a big that's a big change in baseline because all the rest of the interview her head is pointing upwards and then in that part of her interview her head's i mean that's a big that's a big change in this particular case we see her legs disappear completely and come up off the ground and into the chair that's really quite significant i, I like your theory uh, about it about it chase i really like like that look whether that theory is accurate or or in, inaccurate um uh, you know is 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 you know we will we, we we may well find out over time however it's clearly a big thing is happening here clearly a big thing is happening here um it's a spiritual pose as well so i think you're right chase in that it gives it's high status it's like and then the head bows and everything goes internal and there's just a lot of space a lot of thinking space i think there's some real thinking going on there as well i think this has given her time to to work out what's what's next because she doesn't really answer the question at all the question is you know is there anything else that we should have asked she doesn't answer that she goes back into enforcing the extreme emotional state that the husband was in so back to the old story doesn't answer the question but what a bold and big uh big move never seen anything so big uh, apart from standing on your head in a interview room uh scott what you got on this one all right i think the interrogator did that on purpose i know what that looks like and we've talked about that before not in this specific situation she's trying to make her this did the same thing to ted bundy trying to make her feel smart trying to make her feel like the interrogator is not very smart i think she did it on purpose i think she's i think the interrogator is that smart i think she's that slick because this is going so smoothly it's going so well everything's just kind of moving right along there's no uh button of heads or anything and she's getting all this information out of her and i I think she 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 did that on purpose. That was that was my take from it. Because as soon as I saw it, I said, "Oh my gosh, that's what she's doing." And you're right, Chase. She got all cocky at that point. She she thinks she's she's got it all figured out, and that's what you want sometimes. So that might have been the road she was going down. And the question was was excellent. And you're right, Greg. It's 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 the uh, you know is there anything you haven't told me that you feel like you should tell me? I use that when I'm talking to entrepreneurs. When I when I get hired to go talk to entrepreneurs, these guys are getting ready to. Uh, invest in 
And they said, go talk to these people. See if they're, see what's going on over there. As I talked to us, I'm here just to talk to you and see what, you know, see what's going on. That's one of the, the one. And it's about, you want to make it feel like it's the last thing you want to ask them. But when you're about three fourths of the way through, that's when you, you scoot that one out because that gives you that extra time to work on all that. If they say anything uh, that that's weird or out of pocket or something you didn't expect, you've still got that time to, to talk to them about it. Um, I, 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 I'll leave it there. But I, I, I think that that the interrogator knew. What are you going to say, Greg? You know why I use it that way is I give them an out, make them feel like the door is close. And then they feel oh. liberated. And you go, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Just one more thing. Just one more thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The eyewitness is you. And then do you remember if uh, at any time, so you were trying to get away from him right. and you heard the shot. Prior to the shot, do you remember at any point hearing your husband or your brother saying anything to any either of them? No. Um, so my second very ridiculous question mm -hmm. is, is there anything else that I didn't ask about or anything that we didn't cover that you think is important? Um, I always ask that just because I wasn't there, and so we're right, going through right. something that happened right. a super small amount of time. Yes. Can so, I yeah, go for it. Just thinking. Just so angry, like super scary. Did you? Not that you take your phone away from like a sixteen-year-old and uh -huh. freak out. Uh -huh. Like their world disintegrates. Like I've taken my phone away from a sixteen-year-old boy before, and he like he's like wanted to kill himself because yeah. like they cannot function. That's how it was. It was like it's something on his phone that he does not want me to see. That uh -huh. he was like freaking out, mm -hmm. like. To the point where I thought he would hit me in the back of the head to get the phone. Okay. So you thought... In, okay. So you thought... And not, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but um, you thought it was possible that he was going to hurt you. Absolutely. He was going to hurt me and okay. Tylee. Okay. Not JJ. He would never hurt JJ. Okay. And he hurt my brother. Like, yeah. He, he was going, like, ballistic about... It was that. Okay. Um, I'm going to go talk to her real quick. Okay. Um, and then if obviously, you know, we'll be here for a little bit, hopefully not too much longer. Um, but if you think of anything or there's anything that kind of pops in your head or something else that we didn't cover, obviously. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go talk to her for just a little bit and then I'll kind of come back and check with you and then, um, we'll kind of go from there. So I know, um, my partner's talking to your brother over in one of the other interview rooms. Um, so we're going to just try to get, you know, as much done as we can and go from there. Okay. Okay. And then, um, is there anybody that you need to call or anything, or you want to wait a little bit? I don't know what I would say. No. And wait a little bit. We'll see. Yeah. Um, um, I don't know what I would say. And if you want to, you can think about it. So um, we do have um, victim services. Um, that work within the police department. They're right over here. They're not cops. They're civilians. Um, and they do, um, Jessica, who was out there with the fire department, so they're kind of our crisis response. They come right away. Mm -hmm. So our victim services that work in the department are kind of more long-term um, type support systems. So um, they're just a really good resource because they do a lot of stuff with our families and things like that and can help with support services and questions you might have. She's been through so much. So it might be, it might be a good idea. I just can't stand for her to have to go through all this. Yeah. It might be a good idea maybe before you, I take you guys back today that I get one of them to come in and maybe sit and talk with you guys and see. And it's not something they, there's a bunch of stuff they can, you know, offer, but it's 
good to have a contact and like a name and a face and a phone right. number. You know, that way maybe a couple days from now, a week from now, or if there's something going on or you think you need help with something, it may not be something that's necessarily up like me and my partner's alley, but it very much well may be up theirs. Um, so I'd like for you to meet one of them um, before we leave. That way, hopefully, it's if there's something that they can help you and your daughter with, they can, or even JJ or whatever else. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I thought about him. <laughs> yeah. So I think he's used to him not being there, but he wouldn't understand even if you told him. Right. Like that somebody passed away, he doesn't understand what, what that, that means. means. Well, I mean, it's hard at seven to understand that. <laughs> right, place. that's true. But with him, he just doesn't. Which yeah. is probably better because he doesn't comprehend things. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. It's just yeah, it's a lot to think about. Yeah. So let me go uh, find one of them, and then... All right, Chase, what do you got? I'll just say one thing. When this video comes back up, I'd, all I want you to look at from my end, uh, y'all may ask some more, but when it comes back up, just look at every single moment she says a word or two with her eyes closed. That's all. You'll see everything that you've ever wanted to see, and you'll be doing it yourself. Uh, Scott, what do you got? Your, your mic sounds like one of those, those ASMR mics when you're talking. I don't know what microphone you're using, but it's my MacBook. It sounds. Well, it's, it's working MacBook. very well. Wow. It's working very well. Yeah, it's really weird, yeah. man. It's, uh, it sounds like you're doing that ASMR stuff. Is that the way you say an ASMR? When they're pretending yeah. they're typing and stuff? You know, get that whole thing. Um, she's just rehashing the reason she's going back through making her list of why it's this guy's fault. And that that's, I mean, I could go on for 10 days about that. That's really all I, I got on. There's my list of stuff. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I think though she starts apprehensive about a question. Here comes the, she thinks there's a big, hard question coming, I believe. And the reason I say that she starts off with her chin down to throat protect in apprehension of that question coming. Then she realized she's given a bone. She starts to illustrate again. Her hands come back up. Her voice is too monstrous. She's back to Big Lori. Going ballistic about pause, 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 pause. It was bad. Request for approval. Forehead up. Crosses her arms. And there's lip compression and then an okay at the front of the mouth. I think she was afraid. And then she comes to this. I think now she's in a glide path and she thinks the end is close enough. I, I think she expected this to be harder and more of an interrogation. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, okay, so you're gonna have to go back and watch the, that video a couple more times because I got something, you're gonna focus on what Chase said there, then go back again and focus on something completely different. Now with AMSR, I don't know whether you've watched any of that stuff, uh, but it's quite interesting because they often, those presenters often do stuff with their hands as well and they'll like, you know, tap on the mic stuff. And, but also they'll, they'll do kind of flicky things with their fingers oh. as well. And you know, it's a kind of to, to not just, um, you know, hourly excite you, but visually excite Cite you as well. Watch the interviewer's hand. You get a really great close up of the interviewer's hand. And I and I, I agree with you all. I think this interviewer, this interrogator, is really quite good. Because I want you to see how um indefinite and indirect the hand movements are there's nothing there's nothing pointed or direct around it it's all very indefinite because she's creating this idea of look there's lots of opportunity you can go and meet this person and then we'll maybe come back and then maybe something else will happen and like there's no big deal there's nothing terrible going on it's all really good creating a sense i believe of confidence in this in this subject potentially even overconfidence so she may be able to come back with some new ideas and dis and create some discomfort so it's lovely lovely what's going on there enjoy that if you're into amsr and the visuals of that you got something quite beautiful happening there yeah that's all i got on that. oh no i got one last thing on this the subject says um that um that her kid wouldn't understand the the death wouldn't understand somebody being dead the the kid um well my understanding would be uh, from about the ages of three to five most developed kids will understand death but they don't understand necessarily that it's forever so and they'll start to play with the idea of death and they'll play you know being dead games but they always come back to life from five to seven 
and seven and above, the permanence of death is understood. So is it that this mother uh, feels that the child is is not correctly developed? That's correct, Mark. He is. Oh, okay. He is. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, then, yeah, she's right. Then, then he wouldn't. Fair play. Fair play to yeah. her. Perfect. The eyewitness is you. So you thought, and not, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but um, you thought it was possible that he was going to hurt you. Absolutely, he was going to hurt me and okay. Tylee. Okay. Not JJ. He would never hurt JJ. Okay. And he hurt my brother. Like, yeah. He, he was going, like, ballistic about... It was bad. Okay. Um, I'm going to go talk to her real quick. Okay. Um, and then if... Obviously, you know, we'll be here for a little bit, hopefully not too much longer. Um, but if you think of anything or there's anything that kind of pops in your head or something else that we didn't cover, obviously. Um, so I'm going to go talk to her for just a little bit, and then I'll kind of come back and check with you. And then um, we'll kind of go from there. So I know um, my partner's talking to your brother over in one of the other interview rooms. Um, so we're going to just try to get, you know, as much done as we can and go from there. Okay. Okay. And then, um, is there anybody that you need to call or anything, or you want to wait a little bit? I don't know what I would say. No. And wait a little bit. We'll see. Yeah. Um, I don't know what I would say. And if you want to, you can think about it. So um, we do have um, victim services um, that work within the police department. They're right over here. They're not cops. They're civilians. Um, and they do, um, Jessica, who was out there with the fire department, so they're kind of our crisis response. They come right away. Mm -hmm. So our victim services that work in the department are kind of more long-term um, type support systems. So um, they're just a really good resource because they do a lot of stuff with our families and things like that and can help with support services and questions you might have. She's been through so much. So it might be, might be a good idea. I just idea. can't stand for her to have to go through all this. Yeah. It might be a good idea maybe before you I take you guys back today that I get one of them to come in and maybe sit and talk with you guys and see. And it's not something they, there's a bunch of stuff they can, you know, offer. But it, it's good to have a contact and like a name and a face and a phone right. number. Okay. You know, that way maybe a couple of days from now, a week from now, or if there's something going on or you think you need help with something. It may not be something that's necessarily up like me and my partner's alley, but it very much well may be up theirs. Um, so I'd like for you to meet one of them um, before we leave. That way, hopefully, it's if there's something that they can help you and your daughter with, they can, or even JJ or whatever else. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I never thought about him. <laughs> like, yeah. So. I mean, he's used to him not being there, but he wouldn't understand even if you told him. Right. Like, that somebody passed away, he doesn't understand what, what that, that means. means. Well, I mean, it's hard at seven to understand that <laughs> anyway. Right, that's true, but with him, he just doesn't, which yeah. is probably better because he doesn't comprehend things, mm -hmm. but I don't know. It's just, that's yeah, a lot to think about. Yeah. So, let me go uh, find one of them, and then... <laughs> So one of the victim services, Denise, is here. Um, so I kind of told her just a little bit of what happened. Okay. So if you're good with it, I'm going to have her come over and I'm going to introduce her to you guys so you guys can talk for a little bit, um, which kind of works well, too, because I need to run over to where my partner's at and just talk to him a little bit. Okay. Um, that way you guys will have a little bit, hopefully, extra support if you need it. So I'm going to go grab Denise real fast and then introduce you guys. Okay. Okay. All right, I'll go first on this one. The guilty sleep. <laughs> That's really all I got to say. She's so relaxed. 
she goes to sleep. She's so confident. She did, or maybe not even confident. She's just relaxed. None of it bothers her. You know why? Because nothing can bother her because she doesn't have the uh, proper amygdala function in there. I would say it's just my opinion. But if you're dealing with a psychopath, things like this don't bother him at all. Not even a little bit. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Okay. So let me just put forward an idea for the for the opposite of that, just because I can. Okay. Uh, both hands are protected. Both ankles are protected. The abdomen is protected. Um, and so and so maybe she looks casual, and her head is down as well. So the neck's protected. Maybe she looks casual, but actually it's the play dead response, and she is feeling some fear. Now, I don't know, because I'm not a mind reader. I think both ideas there are, are, you know, potentially potentially the ones. It could be a bit of both. Could be a bit of both. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? I think she's in her headspace. I think she is locked down tight. Her body's locked down tight. There's protection. There's whatever. But whether she is headed to sleep or whether she's headed to deep internal, she's behind her face working. I like it. I'd come back in and give her a few more prods and pokes give her a little bit more homework to work on and then put her back behind your face and let her work. That would be me. How about you, Chase? I don't have anything. <laughs> the eyewitness is you. So one of the victim services, Denise, is here. Um, so I kind of told her just a little bit of what happened. Okay. So if you're good with it, I'm going to have her come over and I'm going to introduce her to you guys so you guys can talk for a little bit, um, which kind of works well, too, because I need to run over to where my partner's at and just talk to him a little bit. Okay. Um, that way you guys will have a little bit, hopefully, extra support if you need it. So I'm going to go grab Denise real fast and then introduce you guys. Okay. Okay. So, Mark, what have you seen so far in this? Well, what's thing? amazing for me is one of the biggest changes of baseline I've ever seen, other than somebody potentially standing on their head. So, uh, extraordinary. I will be interested to see what comes up. I don't know whether we will get some uh, some of footage or in court, uh, as we're getting other people in court. Not quite sure, but what an interesting case this could well turn out to be. Chase, what are you seeing so far? Yeah, I think we're seeing a, a combination of a person that has antisocial traits, a lack of empathy, some hardcore uh, membership in what they call a doomsday cult, and there's some possible mental health issues there. And you can see routinely, this is a rare example that we don't see it. We can see it sometimes in an interview with psychopaths, but you can see someone routinely searching through their Rolodex to discover how a rational human being would respond to a a stimulus. Greg? Yeah, guys, I will. I always say this. If you never lived among volatile people, you don't know volatility begets or attracts volatility. And so we don't know what happened in this house. But there there were four people who knew. Three of them are dead. Let's just leave it at that. And two of them, apparently, at, as she's being blamed with. So then we go from there. One of them died of natural causes. But this kind of volatility creates a personality trait. And if she's had this kind of volatility throughout her life and she got married, I think she's been married five times, and every one of those ended in some kind of horrible situation, I don't know, then you expect that people become comfortable in that, whether they're psychopaths or whether they're just broken toys because of things that have happened. They're going to have a different mindset than you do. And so I try to always think, what makes this person do this? I'll leave it at that, Scott. All right. I, yeah, I think this is a wonderful example and study of what I would assume to be a psychopath because we're seeing everything that's always talked about, about them. No emotions, no emotion where it should be. The emotions we're seeing are generated and that aren't real, except for if you see them with anger and those types of things where she talks about that in the situ situation she was in that got her into, into this interrogation in the first place. Um, so I'll leave it right there. 
All right, fellas. I think this was another good one, and uh, we'll see you next time. So what do you got?